First of all, let me thank President and Mrs. Ayun for so graciously welcoming us into your beautiful home. And also, I'd like to beg your indulgence and ask if I might just stay seated. Sometimes I'm a little bit steadier off my feet than on. Um, you certainly gave me a provocation, Carla, uh, <laughs> to suggest that I was, I was going to stir the mix here. Let me tell you, um, to begin with, that my bias in these matters is generally pri issues of privacy. And so with a wide set of questions and a wide set of you know, esteemed panelists, I want us to think carefully about what these matters of public genomics, for example, mean when we think about privacy. So I thought I'd, I'd frame some issues around the question, what animates our interest in DNA and identity? Um, for me, that um, most generally situates itself around DNA and race or DNA and gender, but I'm going to focus, I think, probably more on race than gender. So. In thinking about why we tend to think about these issues together, um, I've suggested some broad categories. One is that we want to have a, we have a desire for a socially stable solution to the issue of health disparities. So we have problems in the United States around health. We've had them ever since um, we started thinking about public health. And we have had differences between racial groups or ethnic groups or men and women. And these have continued to trouble our country, whether we're dealing with institutions of medicine or communities diseases. And when we start thinking about DNA as a response to our issues of health disparities, sometimes the issues that we might be able to resolve socially get pushed into the scientific realm. Instead of thinking about environmental issues with lead poisoning, for example, um, instead of thinking why we might address racism in um, health care rather than race and health care. So sometimes one of the things that happens with our interest in having some way to solve the problems of the disparities in our country, the science seems to set up an objective way when otherwise we would be looking at the subjectivities, the individual bodies. Um, the examples I have here, I, I often think of um, the Sally Field commercial. I don't know if any of you know it. Sally Field is a celebrity spokesperson for osteoporosis, a, a drug called Boniva. And if we went along with, um, and if you re look at that commercial very carefully and watch the fine print, we can see that Boniva or this drug is recommended for people of Asian ancestry. So when I walk into my physician's office and I actually have osteoporosis, there's no real reason for my physician to say, well, let's do a bone density test on you early because you're not Asian. Um, I can tell that by looking at you. Um, now, of course, if I had a DNA test that proved that there was some sort of you know, background in there, I don't know why I have osteoporosis. My mother had it. But if we look at just self-identifying features, those kinds of categorizations that we make that go along with health and disease weed out people in ways that are not often healthy for us. Um, the other example I, I give is that uh, when we're thinking about medicine and race, some of the ways that, that medicine has tried to um, push aside this factor of the subjective and say, well, we're only interested in people who are going to self-identify as. So I look at um, this self-identification is a very social category. The difference between the way my, I don't have much option in self-identifying as a person of color. Um, my nephew, on the other hand, um, the son of my sister, who looks like this young lady sitting next to me, um, people might not know that he is is African American. And so even if we say we are going to dispense with bi potential bias by not having a physician look at someone and say, oh, you're black or you're Asian or you're whatever, and have that person self-identify, we're still working with social categories and not thinking carefully about the history of those categories and why they have such um, vigor in 21st century medicine. The other 
issue around DNA and identity is I think we have a wish, you know, and, and Skip, you called it a, an envy, and I think it's that too. I, I, I was there with the, with the roots envy too, for a personal history. Uh, one of the things I often remember here is with um, Annette Gordon-Reed, who has recently won a Pulitzer for her wonderful book on the Hemingses of Monticello, um, Thomas Jefferson's um, ancestors. Um, and one of the quotes from one of his early one of the early biographers, when Annette Gordon Reed dared to suggest that Thomas Jefferson might have had a relationship with Sally Hemings, he said, this is distinctly out of character, virtually unthinkable in a man of Jefferson's moral standards and habitual conduct. Now, you know, this is a contemporary historian talking about Jefferson's moral character, but so certain, so animated are these stereotypes and these judgments that we make around race and identity that this biographer could not imagine a man who held slaves, to have the moral character, to have a relationship with one of them. So we don't really get rid of the social, even when we have the scientific evidence before us of, of a relationship. I think as well of you know, the ways in which this identity information is being used in contemporary legal matters. Um, and and I'll, of course, I'll defer to my colleague on the issues of the Innocence Project. But think about the black Cherokees um, who are interested in, you know, joining the Cherokee Nation by proving that they, and I think it was Rick Kittles who actually did the research for the, for the black Cherokees to prove that they actually had Cherokee blood in them. Um, imagine their dismay when he went back to um, this community of black Cherokees and he told them that they had more in common with people who lived in Brooklyn than people than with um, the Ch people in the Cherokee Nation, even though they could trace by you know tribal record their relationships. Um, we use race and blood identity very interestingly in legal arenas. We have in, in Hawaii, um, whether or not you can go to a certain school, um, the, the school for native Hawaiians depends on a blood quantum. You know, that's an old fashioned phrase, but we are using it in the 21st century. It wasn't a blood quantum that though could get the black Cherokees to be a member of the Cherokee Nation because the Cherokee Nation did not use blood in order to identify membership. They used written records. As an English professor, I like the written record idea. But you can see that science does not always match the social. I think we also, um, back to my issue of what is animating our interest in um, an association between DNA and identity, I think we also have a fear of error and a desire for personal safety. And here I'm thinking about judicial processes. So if we can just say, this is the DNA proved it. Now, I'm. I don't think you mentioned my home institution is Duke University, which has okay. So that's been recently embroiled in a controversy around um, lacrosse players, and um, DNA came up in this issue, and it was used by both sides, so, so to speak. Um, DNA is either going to prove there was a sexual assault or prove there was no sexual assault. Well, think about what happens in um, criminal cases before there was DNA. A sexual assault did not begin at the point when we could, we could trace the DNA of a perpetrator to the scene. So DNA is not a measure of whether or not a crime occurred, but it can be if you have a particular bias as to how you want a case to come out. And, and if you're sitting on a jury and someone says there's DNA evidence, I know we are all very fearful of making an error in such an important um, an important process. But we also know whether or not we're looking at something as as dated as the O.J. Simpson trial or as new as, as the lacrosse incident, that DNA has um, has a social space in which its use is either useful for the defense or useful for the prosecution. Uh, the other issues that I wanted to just speak briefly about was the, were, were the ideas of public genomics. And there is a move for people to put their whole 
genetic um, background, the map of their genome, onto the web. And I just want us to think about what it means to move into a culture of public genomics before we have had a chance to think about what privacy issues might arise there. Now, just because somebody gave their DNA to Maury Povich to prove you are not the daddy um, <laughs> also means that um, that DNA can arguably be available to anyone who, to the government who might claim an interest in it. Not necessarily for you, but maybe for your brother, or maybe for your uncle. Um, so when the government argues an interest in, in a, what we think was just a private exchange between me and Maury Povich and the five million people who might watch it, um, believe me, the government can, can claim that interest. I also have a concern about what happens to the, um, I think some of you might have seen the New York Times headline a couple of weeks ago that said the FBI is expanding its DNA data banks. And it's expanding at some, and these are state differences, thank you. These are state differences where some states are saying anyone who is stopped um, for suspicion of criminal activity, maybe um, have their cheeks swabbed. Anyone or someone who is arrested, not necessarily convicted, but arrested. And all of this information goes into CODIS, which is the FBI National Data Bank. And there is not much difference now. I mean, at the beginning there was between what we call recreational DNA, DNA that you might use to find your ancestral line. And that same information can be used um, um, for much finer and more scientific purposes now. So we can't quite separate out, well, this was a DNA only to find out who my great-grandmother was, because it might also be a DNA to discover, to um, add you to the registry. And given this particular age of such financial, um, financial instability, when these databases change hands, go out of business, the privacy information that you might have of, of signed in whatever contract you did with one agency is not necessarily going to follow it to its new owners. So we have to think about what, this, what these collections of DNA mean and what it might mean if it's not in the hands that you intended it. So I just want to leave with some just some general questions. What happens when these DNA banks change ownerships? What um, rights are we willing to let the federal government have in terms of this very minute matter? And what risks are there in associating, uh, the final one for me, um, and I think about this when I see the Ancestry.com um, commercial on television, where I think there's a young woman dreaming of being a, um, high wire artist, and then we go back and find out that her family actually <laughs> were the flying Zambonis or whomever. <laughs> so we are so, it's, and it's an oblique, well maybe not so oblique association of talent and ancestry. So because my, I think I remember someone saying, well, because my great-great-grandmother was a teacher, that's probably why I want to be a teacher. Well, those are fine qualities, but think about what they might mean if the, um, inheritance isn't quite so lovely. Um, because my great-great-grandfather was a bank robber, I need to go out to Bank of America you know, with um, a mask on today. So the idea of what we do when we associate traits and characters with DNA, I think we need to think very carefully about, not only in terms of the issue of privacy, but in the facile associations that we make when they seem um, personally beneficial can also turn on us.